Now to our first question tonight. It's from Litona Dunge, sitting with her daughter, Cynthia, in our audience. The whole world has seen, has, has been outraged by the murder of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis. He was ill down, on, down with a knee in his back, saying, I can't breathe, until he died. My son, David Jr., was killed in a very similar circumstances. David was a proud Dungati warrior who was killed in custody in Long, Long Bay Jail Hospital on the 29th of December 2015. David was 26 years old, just like George Floyd. David was pushed down into the ground by heavy officers. David cried out, I can't breathe many times in the space of, of his last nine minutes, despite over 430 Aboriginal deaths in custody since the Royal Commission, no police of prison officers has ever been held criminally liable. We know we have a long, long fight ahead to get justice. So I'm asking the panel Will you join us to demand charges are laid on the people responsible for my son's death? Main White. Arnie, I'm the same age as him. He could have been sitting here right now. Unfortunately, he's not. I was, on, I was at the process on the weekend. Um, since 2015, uh, in 2016, um, my nephew, uh, passed in Kalgoorlie. Uh, I know this experience all too well. I was arrested when I was 11 years old. I've been um, uh, searched for my pockets. Uh, this is a fight that I have to go on for the rest of my life. I'm an actor, but I'm a black man first. I'm an Indigenous man. I'm an Aboriginal man. Um, this is my life. I, I, I don't get to turn off. I don't get to switch off. I don't get to go home. I don't have that privilege. Um, I will be fighting until my last breath because racism isn't going to die. It's not going to leave. It's going to be here after I'm gone. Unless we do something about it. So I'll be fighting for the rest of my life. Lieutenant Cynthia, can I just ask, you've talked about the similarity between the death of George Floyd and, and your son's death. When you heard that those were George Floyd's last words, how did you react? Well, the whole family was so devastated and tears just come all from our eyes. We we just couldn't believe that it's been a, a repeat. But it, it, over the overseas, it's happened with a black black man. And uh, it's not good. And you've got black man here in Australia that's got killed the same way. So I, it's so devastating for two mothers. Uh, and, um, let me put this to you, Senator Bragg. How, how do you respond when a mother says mm. to you, you know, I just want justice? Well, Latona, thank you very much for being here and for uh, taking the time. It's, um, I'm very sorry for your loss and I'm sorry that Australia has let you down. Um, the, at a national level, uh, we are trying to accept the hand that the Indigenous community has um, expended uh, through the Uluru Statement, which asks for structural reforms. Now, um, that is something that is very important to heal our country. Uh, at the local level, I mean, I understand and a lot of the feedback that I'm presented with is that um, relations with the police at the local level is, is a very important issue. And uh, there are very bad examples and there are very good examples. Now, in, in your case, I'm, 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 I'm going to commit myself to spend my time in Parliament to work on these issues. Nakia Louis, when you hear a cry for something simple like justice. I mean, do, do you feel anything is enough in terms of a response? OK, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. You were so brave. Um, you know, I grew up being scared from the police, you know, a similar way I'm an Aboriginal woman and a Torres Strait Islander woman before I'm ever an actor or a writer. You know, I know what it's like to have your dad leave and not come back and you don't know what's happened, to live in fear. I'm lucky because I have fair skin privilege and really that's the difference sometimes between being alive and being dead and I want that to be very clear because we're not crying out for justice, Hamish. We're saying don't kill us. That's a really 
basic, simple request. Do not kill us. We don't need to be coming to the table with this. It just needs to change because it's been happening. The royal inquest into deaths in custody happened in 1991. That was the inquest. There were people being killed in custody before then. Aboriginal people have been fighting for our lives since 1788. Black Lives Matter in this country has been a movement since colonisation. So we're not asking for the world. We're asking to live. And to be honest with you, Andrew, yeah, we can say there's good police, there's bad police, but quite frankly, if people in positions of authority can't not kill a vulnerable, a vulnerable person who's locked up, then maybe we need to relook at these institutions because the thing is, is that we can change them. They're just that, they're just institutions. And if they are set up where you can't even trust that someone isn't going to be killed with a knee on their neck because they can't breathe, then that institution isn't working. So for me, I stand by you. I'll be there every step of the way. And I'm sorry that had to happen to your son. And um, I just, I still can't believe we're fighting for it for this day. I'm sorry. I, I, I thank you for being so brave. When Could you, I just... You, um, just, if you wouldn't mind, just waiting a moment, Niado, Nikira, I just want to understand, though, when, in the context of everything you've just said, when yeah. the Prime Minister responds to this moment and says there is no need to import things that happen in other countries, that, that Australia is a wonderful country, how do you respond to that? Well, I think it's incredibly ignorant and I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's purposely so. I think a lot of people would, would argue it's a wonderful country. I'm sure the family of David Dunge would argue if it's a wonderful country. You know, police brutality is the very tip of the iceberg because we see it. The bottom of the iceberg is that there are massive inequalities with Aboriginal life since closing the gap. I mean, this is a broad spectrum thing. So when the Prime Minister says this is a wonderful country, he should really you know, it's tone deaf and it's disrespectful because Aboriginal people, all we want to do is, is, is have equality. All we want to have to do is an opportunity to reach for the stars and dream and we just don't want to... We don't want to be killed because we're black. And so I think it's, it's, it's incredibly tone deaf. And also, if he talks about importing issues from overseas, Black Lives Matter has been, as I said, it's been an issue here since colonisation. It's been an issue since the Frontier Wars, since 1938 when we had our first day of mourning when they were protesting not to take our children. That's Black Lives Matter. So this is an imported. And also, if the Prime Minister wants to talk about uh, importing issues of the US presidency, well, the Coalition has had a long history of uh, going and banging the, the drum behind the US when it comes to other foreign political issues, Vietnam War or recently COVID-19 and... So I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's been it's picking and choosing. It's a complete denial. That's mm. what it is, really. It's been continuous since uh, Captain Cook landed on the shores. It's, it's still happening. It's a denial of our existence. It's a uh, denial of uh, our existence this whole entire time because it hasn't been an issue that has ever been raised. It's, it's, it's still happening right now to this day. Last Friday, a brother boy died in Western Australia. This is, we're still talking about it now. It's a denial of what's happening right now. These institutions are killing us and, and it's just the continuation the whole time since 1770. It's the same thing. That's what it is. This, and what, what are we going to do about it? We're not, we're not asking, we're demanding. We're demanding justice. And those, those protests in America, you, 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 they're not protests, they're demanding it. And this is what's happening. There are riots and people are talking about order. Who cares about order if there's no justice? We want justice. I'm sick of talking about being order. Because um, you know what? It doesn't work. Being peaceful, peaceful protests don't work. You, you, you're never satisfied. You're never happy for what we do. It, i got to sit here and i gotta, I got to be the nice guy. I don't want to be the nice guy no more. Because no one listens to you. No one listens to you. I'm sick of being this person, that, this animal. I don't want to be an animal no more. I just want to bring in Niado because I know you were trying to, to say something during yeah. that. I just wanted to say, I think um, what we're hearing here is the need just for acknowledgement that, um, that Indigenous people have suffered great, great, great injustice. Um, and the statement that this is not America is really a statement that shows either indifference or a unacceptable lack of awareness. Um, it's a statement that I think is used to defer away from talking about things that are wrong in this country. 
And it's used to defer these things in two ways. First, of course, obviously, is to say, don't bring whatever is happening in America here. And secondly, is to tell people that things are not as bad as America. But from the stories we've, he we've heard here today from indigenous people, things are as bad. Things have always been as bad. You know, we have indigenous people that have lived on this land but have been dispossessed of their land. They've watched their culture destroyed. They've watched their children killed. They've seen over 400 people die in custody without no one being held accountable. And that, the way that indigenous people have been treated, is a clear statement that our institutions are not adequately addressing the serious issues that are here. So I think to tell a group of people who have been surviving since colonialism that things are not as bad is tremendously dismissive and erasive of the issues that are happening. And also, even if you look at other groups of people, and I admit and completely accept that our situation is not comparable to what Indigenous people are going through, but you can also see traces and complaints about racism, race profiling among African Australians and other people of, of, of uh, who are non-white. And these have been recorded, they've been litigated, um, and there are accusations that include even assault and abuse, allegedly, by police. Um, and so the idea that somehow uh, this is not happening in Australia is not true. Uh, it is happening. What I tend to find in this discussion, uh, unfortunately, and without wanting to point fingers, is that the people who tend to say these comments, the people who say things are not bad, you know, um, are not, do not look like the kind of people that would end up beneath the knee of a somebody having the life squeeze out of them. So perhaps to those people, you know, perhaps if we're really serious about moving forward collectively as a country, perhaps, perhaps sit down and actually listen to the pain that you're hearing here to truly take it in and to realize that sometimes we might live in the same country, but experience completely different realities. And we cannot insist on sort of a mystical ideas of fairness and equality and justice, which actually doesn't exist equally among all of us. So we hear the pain here. And I would like to you know, say to um, everybody on this panel, particularly the indigenous people who have come here and share your story, I am sorry that you know, I did not know the name, even a single name, of the 400 people that were murdered, but I knew the names of black Americans that were murdered, because it's something that is inherent somehow in this country that we do not take indigenous issues seriously enough, and we should.